Mr. President, may I please introduce Ambassador Williams? Yes, Mr. Ambassador. Hello, Mr. President. Turn and move. All right. And my wife, Jane. Hi, Hello there. Nice to see you. Well, I think we ought to get a family picture. Oh, nice. Ambassador, thank you. Well, in this era, it's very hard to be first at anything, but you're the first of our ambassadors to Mongolia. Yes. yes. And I know your Asian experience is going to help you forge a relationship that maybe might be quite a little difficult right now. Yes, we'll have to start small. <laughs> well, just one second. A little reminder. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. It's an honor to wear. Well, <laughs> Well, good luck. Certainly, Certainly appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Introduce Ambassador Lugano. Mr. Well, President, how are well, you? Well, pleasure to see you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having confidence in me. Well, I appreciate it. I do, and I appreciate thank it. Thank you. This is my wife, Prudence. Hello there. Nice to, to see you. My daughter, Carla. Hello. Hello. My son, Larry. Hello. Hello. My father, John. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. President? How are you? Just fine. Good. It's wonderful. Lots of luck with you. Thank you. This is my mother-in-law, Jean Sarian. Hello, dear. Good to shake hands with you. Well, it's an honor. Pleased to have you. And my sister, Connie Oliva. Pleasure. And her husband, Tom Oliva. Great pleasure. We brought us the whole crowd to see this well. And I think, you we, and I think we ought to get a family photo. And thank uh, you. Be I think some of you may be coming from yeah. this side. Yeah, on the side. Right. Okay. Carla, maybe you want to go on the other side. I'll go on this side, Mr. President. Pop over here. Okay. Can we all? Before you leave, just one second here. You and for your wife. Thank you. Just a little reminder. Of Thank you. <laughs> and I thought the rest of you here might some key rings with the seal on for Thank a you, souvenir of that visit to the Oval Office. Thank you. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, good luck. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us here. Please, Dad. Thank you. Stick with us. Right. Pleasure. Thank you. Many healthy years here, President. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. Have a good day, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. President, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Ryan. Yes, hello. Mr. President. Nice to meet you, sir. Well, nice to meet you. Why don't you turn and we'll... Thank you. Well, Thank you, sir. Well, I know with what you've been doing, with, you're going to have a well-run embassy there. I hope Swagger. so, sir. I'll do my best. Well, my Thank you very Marlene much. My daughter Marlene has been there in a couple of... I hope she comes again well, while I'm there. It could be. Good. Yes. All right. Well, and we'll just soon... Ah, soon thank you very much, sir. <laughs> thank you. God bless you. Well, God bless you. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. President, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Barrett. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. President? Very pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet my wife, Mavis. Hello there. Mr. President, so nice to meet you. And my you. daughter, Elizabeth. Nice Hello. Nice well, I think maybe with the ladies in the middle, we ought to get a family picture. Oh, how nice. Our best, our best regards to Ms. Reagan. Okay. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. 
present. President, I'd like to introduce Ambassador David Al. How are you, Mr. President? Yeah. Good to see you, sir. Thank, Thank you for receiving me. Well. Mr. President, this is my wife, Joan. Nice there. to meet you, Mr. President. How do you do? My daughter, Audrey. Hello, Mr. President. And my nice daughter, Gwen. Hello. I think maybe the ladies would get in the middle between us. Okay, okay. that'd be very nice. Thank photo. you. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay. One more lady. Okay. I know that you're going to serve us well there in Zambia. And incidentally, I had the pleasure of meeting President Kayonda last year. So I understand you did. Please give me my regards. I shall do that, sir. For the two young ladies key. Thank you very much, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Says visit. Oh, what a nice surprise. Thank you, sir. Cufflinks. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, thank you for what you're doing. I oh, wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you.
waves of the media and the press coming in and we'll uh, wait at least for the first one which is just photographic to do their chore and then wait for the second one to come in and when they leave we'll really get underway. It's nice there at the end of the table. <laughs> You know, there's a sacrilegious little remark about here that this is a little like what the Lord said at the Last Supper. Everybody that wants to get in the picture, get on this side of the table. <laughs> I can't help but notice, sir, that the, the tape recorder is uh, clearly in evidence. It's, uh, it's obvious. Well, the next one in will be the one for... Uh, uh, that would be more than photographic. <laughs> How many times a day do I have to do that? <laughs> I think it was narrowly. Oh, say, that was a <coughs> wonderful trip down memory lane for me. A short time ago, I was down in the press room, and uh, I attempted a joke in response to a question, and I think I, I was kidding, but I don't think I should have said what I said, but uh, with some of those who were present in that room, I think I should tell them that I do believe the medical history of a president is something that people have a right to know, and I speak from personal experience. What, can you base your remark on any knowledge? Nope. I was just trying to be funny, and it didn't work. <laughs> now we all want to know what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I won't repeat it again in front of them, but I have a, I think that I will say I thank you all for coming, and I want to welcome you here today uh, and begin by speaking briefly about Nicaragua. It was last August that the Sandinistas signed on to the Guatemala Accord and once again pledged themselves to democracy. And since then, two deadlines have passed. Neither were met, and last January, the four Central American democracies agreed that Nicaragua had failed to comply, had failed to democratize, and called for immediate Sandinista compliance. Then Congress cut off military aid to the freedom fighters, and the Sandinistas have become only more repressive. The chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator David Boren, said a few days ago, the idea that if we removed all the pressure on the Sandinistas, they would somehow then move to peace and democracy has been proven false. Well, the fact is that it is only strong pressure on the Sandinistas from Nicaragua's democratic resistance that offers any hope of keeping the compliance process alive. And for regional security, freedom is the bottom line. By guaranteeing freedom for the Nicaraguan people, we will also guarantee peace and stability for the rest of Central America. Senator Boren warned, as I have repeatedly, that Sandinista subversion poses the risk of potential chaos in Central America all the way up to the Rio Grande. I believe that the American people want to prevent that from happening. But on matters of national security, the real issue is not whether it's the popular thing, but whether it's the right thing. Standing up for democracy, supporting freedom against communism is the right thing. I know you've closely followed the state of press freedom in Nicaragua, and I applaud that. Yes, you do this out of reciprocal interest, but also because the issue is fundamental to you and to all of us. The Sandinistas have tried to eliminate the independent press because they want to carry out the rest of their program under cover of darkness. But despite arrests, beatings, death threats, midnight police visits, and violent mob attacks, the few Nicaraguan press outlets not completely state-controlled have tried to keep truth alive for the Nicaraguan people. Three weeks ago, after a 
massive demonstration was brutally put down by the regime, La Prince's headline told the story, Sandinista police beat the people with rifle butts. For that, the newspaper was shut down for 15 days. The church-run Radio Catalica was closed the same day and is still not reopened, and two independent radio news programs have since been suspended. Just two months after taking power, the Sandinista leadership in a message meant only for the party faithful, wrote that we are an organization whose greatest aspiration is to maintain revolutionary power. A free press threatens that, and they will not tolerate one. So much of the discussion of Nicaraguan press freedom is narrowly focused on La Prensa and Radio Catalica because not much else has survived. Two other daily newspapers were seized early on, as were all television stations and most radio stations, and the Sandinistas have refused to give new radio or TV licenses. In Nicaragua, public opinion polls are illegal and free labor unions, opposition political parties, and the Catholic Church have been repeatedly denied the right to publish and are subject to violent intimidation and suppression. Early on, after shutting down a newspaper, one of the Nine Sandinista commandantes warned the, that other media, quote, unless they change their attitude, will have to receive the same medicine. And a week later, the official Sandinista Party newspaper laid out the new regime's theory of the press. It wrote, in our revolutionary process, therefore, there are only two alternatives for journalists. Either they are revolutionaries or they are counter-revolutionaries. In Nicaragua, press freedom must be understood as the Sandinista people's right to decide who should and who should not inform them. Well, the original Sandinista commitments of the OAS, their obligations under the Guatemala Accord and those under the Sapoa Accord of last March have been continuously violated. These have been communist falsehoods told to deceive well-intentioned people. Token relaxations are done to provide a smokescreen then the regime clamps down again, lest the Nicaraguan people believe it's for real. And last January, at the same time that the Sandinistas were again promising their democratic neighbors that they would honor their broken promises under the Guatemala Accord, Nicaraguan opposition leaders and a senior editor of La Prensa were being arrested in Managua. The Sandinistas' real face is not hard to find. A few years ago, the chief of censorship at the Interior Ministry explained the censoring of La Prensa with a comment that would have made George Orwell blush. She said, and I quote, they accused us of suppressing freedom of expression. This was a lie and we could not let them publish it. Well, since the signing of the Guatemala Accord a year ago, the Sandinistas have confiscated film from television crews, organized mob attacks on journalists, electronically comm commandeered radio stations to block news broadcasts, denied newsprint to La Prensa, and prevented the newspaper from getting paper elsewhere. Radio news programs, the chief source of news in Nicaragua, have been closed down again and again in recent months, and some 20 were never permitted to reopen in the first place. And there have been constant threats and acts of intimidation. What greater, greater proof can there be of how these dictators fear a free press than that Sandinista state television has been broadcasting visual personal attacks on the publisher of La Prensa because they fear her ability to tell the truth. <clears throat> or when Interior Minister Tomas Borges summoned the director of a radio station to his office and personally beat the man bloody because the station had reported police attacks on members of a labor union who were on a hunger strike. And in a police state, when the head of the secret police beats you, you can't hit back. Well, when the Guatemala Accord was signed, we knew it would produce one of two things, either Sandinista compliance or Sandinista exposure. But it has succeeded. The Sandinistas have been exposed. After nine long years under the Sandinista communists, in which Jews and Christians have been persecuted, business and labor oppressed, children indoctrinated, a nation militarized, a people abused, and a region subject to constant aggression, the Sandinistas' deceit, and violence and corruption have caught up with them. After nine years of gaining power, and then over a hundred million dollars in U.S. aid approved by a vote of Congress, the Sandinistas could never have held power as they have, had they not continually taken new vows about their democratic intentions. 
When are the people in Congress who have been lied to by the Sandinistas for nine years going to get angry about it? When are the people in Nicaragua going to get the democracy that they fought for and that the Organization of American States set as the necessary condition for the government that it helped bring into being? Today, I call upon the U.S. Congress to keep faith with itself. Last December, by a remarkable six to one margin, the House of Representatives passed the Brian Talon Chandler Amendment that enumerated 33 specific items the Sandinistas would have to honor to comply with the Guatemala Accord, four of them related directly to press freedom. The Sandinistas have failed across the board to meet the minimum criteria specified by Congress. Unless Congress provides new aid to the resistance, I do not see how that body can expect any of its democratic requirements to be met or even taken seriously by the Sandinistas. A new chapter in this issue has now begun because we've reached a point where the true nature and intentions of the Sandinista regime are exposed and beyond dispute. From the crushing of press freedom to the expansion of military plans revealed by Major Roger Miranda, we know who the Sandinistas are and the pose they threat in the region. And I hope that with this knowledge, a new consensus can be reached on our policy. And now I think the press has heard enough that would leave. Are you backing the $47 million aid package? <coughs> what? Are you backing a military aid package for the Congress? Yes, I am, as always. How much? Uh, I don't know the exact amounts that are being talked about, but uh, we could begin with the $18 million worth of military supplies that are in warehouses once passed by the Congress and now are prohibited from releasing the material to uh, to the countries. Vice, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, you mentioned that uh, press freedom was uh, fundamental in uh, Nicaragua. Mr. Coles, can we wait for just a moment? They won't leave as long as the President's talking. So we <laughs> I thought perhaps if I talked, I know they're not interested in my comments. Oh, okay. And then we will take some questions. made a promise to answer something. I'll take your question right after I... Whether I think he should reveal his medical records. And I thought I was being funny. I said, I'm not going to pick on an invalid. <laughs> 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 then I left the room. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of square that with a few of the people that were here. But it was trying to be funny. Well, your question? Uh, back to Nicaragua, uh, uh, Mr. President, you uh, said that uh, one of my exemptions from the U.S. embargo for news from Nicaragua. Well, all of those things we want to see rectified. Our feeling has been that the only efficacy so forth, has come as a result of the threat of